I want to address an aspect of identity uh, and so this is early morning time and no bright lights and all of that but if you look at identity and overlay a sense of rationality and overlay a sense of time you lead to cause and effect. Now, identity is a pattern of thinking, feeling, speaking, doing, and being. And each identity, each pattern of thinking, feeling, speaking, doing, and being yields a certain amount of sustainable well-being per unit of energy invested in a given environment. Being kind in a reptilian environment yields exploitation and betrayal. Being kind in an empathic environment yields light and, and love and delight. Uh, being generous around uh, sustainable people leads to a sense of greater shared abundance for all and reciprocity. Being generous around narcissistic people uh, leads often to being drained financially or, or otherwise. And so there's, we have these identities and they tend to, because of the cultural focus on cause and effect, they tend to evolve or correlate in, in a deep way. Now, this is not a given. One can simply decide, you know, for example, deciding to be happy uh, or deciding to think and feel and speak and focus on a particular thing, regardless of what's going on in the outer environment. In other words, in the chicken and egg dynamic, you have the egg determines, there's a pattern, there's an identity in the egg that determines what kind of chicken it'll be, or what kind of bird hatches out of the egg. And then the environment that the bird is hatched into determines what parts are developed in the bird. So if the bird is hatched into an environment where there isn't enough room to fly, if there's a great need of walking around to get food because there's scarce food and not enough room to fly. So let's say there's a, a ceiling of effective ceiling of three feet tall so you can't really fly without flying into the ceiling and then the food is scarcely distributed so you're gonna do a lot of running and moving around and digging to get that food. Well, that bird is going to have atrophied wing muscles and is going to have very strong legs. Well, you do that for a thousand generations and maybe that, that bird identity evolves into one that lays eggs that can't fly, but has very strong feet. So this is how identity has evolved. And of course, when you're walking rather than flying for you know generations you also maybe lose some of your long distance vision because it's not being used and you use uh, and you use some of your short-term vision and maybe it's dark because there's a three-foot ceiling so you develop more night vision and lose some of the, you know, your eyes get too sensitive to bright lights. Um, 
you know, that's this, uh, we're moving from day to night, night to day in my sleep identity. And because I've been exposed to uh, darkness for a number of hours, as we're moving into this identity, this identity is adjusted more to darkness. Um, and maybe if you watch the video for a while, you get your eyes tune in to more of the subtleties that aren't needed if there's a bright light uh, shining on the object in the video. So this is how identities have evolved traditionally. Um, the environment changes and then the identity moves towards the environment in order to meet its needs to survive, be secure, experience love and belonging, etc. So, uh, so typically, in a causal effect type paradigm, the environment changes and the identity changes. And, and it evolves, uh, you know, slowly as the environment changes. Now, as one becomes masterful and conscious, as one becomes conscious and masterful in the domain of identity, identity can be the leader in the dynamic where the identity changes the environment, where I develop and cultivate this identity and this identity, this pattern of thinking, feeling, speaking, and doing uh, changes the environment. And there you have that. Um, and but, but the question is partly how linked we are to the identity of cause and effect. Meaning, if our identity is very rooted in cause and effect, we need a cause to change our identity so that the identity change can be an effect of something. You said something nasty to me, so I feel hurt and angry. I feel hurt and angry because you said something nasty to me. Okay, we're, we're well, we're comfortably in the realm of cause and effect. And I'm going to stay hurt and angry until something else makes me feel happy. So you apologized, you gave me a box of chocolates, you said it wasn't my fault, you were just having a rotten time, uh, this and that. And so, yeah, so this, this is, causing the identity and then causing it again. And so I'm, I, at this point, I'm responding to my environment. Now the identity, the habit of thinking, feeling, speaking, and being also, uh, you know, follows, well, creates the identity or sustains the identity because we have memory and what we focus on in our outer environment and what our memory, what we focus on in memory and in our outer environment nourishes or sustains the identity. And I think that particularly for traumatized uh, people 
the belief and experience is that the universe and the world is not a, f a safe or friendly place. That the universe and the world is a frightening place. And that part of the fear is the unknown. That the universe and the world is too big so you don't know where the next threat will come from. So you have a fearful unknown. And then that fearful unknown projected based on the belief that the universe is a scary and frightening place leads to a fear of change, a fear of leaving the known. A fear of being out of control. Now if I want to feel more in control, one of the ways that I can do is lean heavily on the rationality uh, of, of belief. Now I say lean heavily because of a couple of things. First of all, there are too many variables and too many systems to predict much of reality through the lens of rationality. If I see a third of the if I th see a third of the orbits, the cycles around me, and then there are another whole third that I just can't see. I, I don't understand them enough to understand that they're in play. And then there's another third that are so big that even though I could understand them, you know, they're, they're 10,000 year cycles. And so Dewey wrote a great book on the study of cycles and it turns out that there's a cycle for just about everything. There's a cycle for the spin in atoms. There's a cycle in the movement of molecules. There's a cycle in the rhythm of sleep. There's a cycle uh, around which each orbiting planet around the sun moves around the sun. There's a cycle around which how the sun moves, you know, in uh, the galaxy. There's a cycle in the frequency of a radio wave. That everything has a cycle, basically, a pattern of movement. Now, the human life cycle is, let's just say, a hundred years. So if the human life cycle is a hundred years, all the 300, 500, 600, 700, 800, thousand, 10,000, million year, billion year cycles, as there are cycles that take exactly 750 million years. There's other cycles that take 150 years. Many of those cycles, you know, 300 year cycle, etc., are just too big to grasp by the conscious mind, which is set at a frequency that tends to be more daily and weekly, and from time to time reviews monthly. It just doesn't show up on the radar. So I've got a third of the patterns I just can't see because my paradigms, my ignorance, my cultural illiteracy blocks the capacity to grasp those patterns. And there's big patterns that I don't see because I've got a narrow beam focus of daily and weekly. And these patterns are out here and unless you have a big you know, 10,000 year focus, you just don't grasp them. And then I'm in my predictable and known cycles. Well, if we're going to be, quote, rational and study the relationship between cause, this thing happened effect and I felt and thought this, uh, the, the rational thing to do is to explore all two third, you know, all, all of the causes. 
because if we reduce this to the simplest equation, if, if there's cause and effect and we have uh, two people in a tug of war, then you know the the most weight and pulling if you know typically measured by you know twice as many people let's just say that on average twice as many people will win the tug of war as half the people but if two thirds of the people are unaccounted for due to blindness or they they show up unexpectedly every 10,000 years right at the key moment then there's a lot of things in the tug of war that you just cannot predict. You, you, you don't know that that's going to happen or not happen until it happens. Uh, but there can still be a strong attachment to the idea of cause of an effect in order to create the illusion of conscious control um, by pretending that the world is simpler than it is so that it will fit. And um, So uh, I think in part the degree of childhood trauma determines how much the unknown is feared, how much the universe is perceived as a friendly or unfriendly place, which in turn leads to a a strong desire to never feel that way again, never feel so helpless, never feel so small and hurt and alone and traumatized again, which in turn leads to the desire to be in control because if you never want to feel a certain way, but you have zero control in an environment that's unfriendly, then good luck with that. And so you want to feel control. Uh, as the medicine or the antidote to helplessness and terror. And in order to feel more control, focusing on cause and effect is a necessary prerequisite to predict the future. Because if you cannot predict the future, you have no control. The fact that I can predict that intending to extend my arm extends it, it gives me a sense of security because I know what's going to happen because I'm making it happen because I can control the future. The future is an extended arm, there it is. The future is a retracted arm, there it is. This, ah, thank heavens, I have some control and so I never want to feel that way again I want to feel like this, I don't want to feel like this, I never want to feel that way again, has a need for control, has a need for agency, which has a need for predictability. So now we have, in order for there to be predictability, there has to be cause, there has to be effect. In order for there to be effective predictability, I've got to see the cause and predict the effect. And so now we're in a domain where the question is how much control do I need to feel safe? How much control do I need to feel safe? Because however much control I need, 
I've got to be in a domain where I can predict in order to feel, to get that amount of control. Like, I'm in my house, uh, in my body, in front of my camera, doing with nobody around. So I've got control. Out, in, out, in, out, in. Now, if I'm in a subway and trains moving 60 miles an hour and it's absolutely packed, you know, you can barely, you know, get three people pushed. See, now I'm not in control. I can't just do that because what if someone said, don't touch me? What if someone hit my hand? What if I try and push and the body in front of me won't move because the body in front of them won't move. So now I do not have control. I can't just say, that's me doing this. I predict it because there's other variables. In other words, the more frightened I am of the world, the more pain I'm trying to avoid. All fear is predicated on avoiding pain. If there's no pain, there's no fear. If there's no future, there's no fear. All fear is, I had pain before, I don't want to feel it. I'm afraid of feeling that pain. That pain could come again in the future, so I'm afraid of the future. I'm afraid of being out of control in the future and that pain happening again. I'm in pain. I don't want to be in pain. I'm afraid of the pain in the past happening again in the future and me being out of control. And so how do I maintain the illusion of total control in a dynamic where a third of the variables I just don't see, and a third of them, well, two thirds of them I don't see, because a third of them I can't see within the framework that I've built, the lens of sensory and mental awareness. And then the other ones are just too, too big and too long. Um, so again, I can't see those because how can I predict something that happens every 10,000 years if I can only see within a one to two week window? So here we have um, fear of pain, fear of the past repeating itself, fear of the future, need for control, so the emphasis on rationality and the fear of all these things that I don't see. And so we, have a, we can get very small in life. I don't want to leave my room. That's, you have a lot more control in your room. I don't want to meet a new person. What if they don't like me? What if this and that? I don't want to um, say this thing I've never said before. I don't want to get out of bed and make a new video that I've never seen before. I don't want to uh, have my hair look like this the way it's never looked before. You know, I'm sure my hair has never looked quite like this. So there's all these variables. What if this, what if that, what if the other? Now, if we let go of the need to be in control, and if we let go, which means letting go of the fear, which means letting go of the resistance to the pain, we have a lot more freedom. We could have an identity lead the environment as, a, as not a control as much as a statistical probability. Let's smile and give warm hugs to everyone today and see what happens. 
Some people will feel creeped out. If you're in America, that's pretty typical these days. Some people will feel war warm and nourished. Some people will feel confused because they think they, it's not cool, but they really like it. So they're confused. Do I want to enjoy myself or do I want to be cool? Um, but, and some people will reciprocate. And so we'll have a wonderful reciprocity. <sighs> so this is, um, where did that come from? Maybe a dream. What's, you know, what's the cause of this new identity? I have an imagination of it and I like it. I like that warm picture. Um, and again, each new identity will yield a different result in a specific environment. If you hug sociopaths, uh, in a scarcity environment, some of them are going to knife you while you're hugging them so that they can steal whatever it is that is scarce that you may have. So now you've got, uh, you know, hugging leading to death in a scarcity environment with the reptilian brain as the primary operating system. Maybe you hug someone in a friendly environment, you have laughter and smiles. In a homophobic environment, you hug men and maybe they'll punch you or maybe they'll avoid you uh, and maybe you'll feel small and be rejected, whatever. If you're a woman and you hug, wo and you hug women in a homophobic environment, maybe it's lots of fun you know, because the environment says that's okay. Whereas the environment threatens to shame and humiliate you and your partner if you're two males and being affectionate. And so there's all this dynamic in the, in the you know, of the exact same identity in different environments. Every identity has a yield of sustainable well-being in a particular environment. And, uh, but what I want to look at is the idea of simply creating an identity because it's fun. Now, this is something that is more consistent with the belief that the universe is a friendly place. And that it's fun and interesting to explore. And uh, that you want to create a pattern because you could say that the environment is shaping the ego, which is the identity, perhaps. Um, the pattern of thinking, feeling, speaking, and doing. But there's also the self, the eternal self, the sphere. There is the ideal. And that can also shape by dwelling on the ideal, by dwelling on the self with a capital S, that, that inner sense. That can also lead to movement in the identity to bring soulfulness, to bring being into the identity, through the identity, to be a carrier of the divine, because the divine is the sphere. The divine is the symmetrical one. And so to bring a carrier of the divine is to move, to think, to think to speak, to do, to feel, to be in such a way that that divine self comes through. Now, what do you do when the divine self is not welcome? When the divine self is crucified? 
because in that sense we have the metaphor of Jesus on the cross that the divine energy comes through and is a new energy. The divine energy comes through in a sociopathic environment, in an environment in which it is crucified. Misunderstood, punished, avoided, feared, rejected, the, the divine comes through and is met with hostility, with fear, with hate. And so the div divine is damaged. The pattern of thinking, feeling, speaking, doing, and being collides with the identity. And the environment always wins in the long term, certainly statistically speaking. Uh, because if the environment determines who will get what money, who will get what food, who will get what sex, if the environment determines who will survive and feel secure in that, who will get their human needs, the environment is selecting for a pattern and a traumatized culture or a traumatized environment is primarily frightened of the unknown. And so it's primarily selecting for the known. A traumatized environment is primarily selecting for the known. And so if you are unknown, if you are different, you will be attacked because you are different, because you are unknown, because you represent a threat to the fear of pain, a threat to the strategy of avoiding pain by, by never being out of control, by staying with the known. And so the divine is rejected as an anomaly, as a deviation from the pattern. And and so the ego, the the the, the sense of identification with the self needs and wants to meet their needs to be accepted and so we'll reject the divine identity the pattern of thinking feeling speaking and doing that comes from the sphere because when you reference the sphere then you take the imbalances the dis-ease within the current cult and within the current identity and you restore that. You restore that by listening to the sphere, by listening to the field. As you do so, you bring the blessings of the divine. You bring the blessings of the goddess, of the one back into the dis-ease of the identity of the cult, which is often, you know, it's not referencing the one, it's referencing itself. All self-referential patterns uh, are less evolutionary than patterns that reference the larger field. I eat porridge because I ate porridge yesterday. I ate porridge yesterday 
because I ate porridge as a child. I ate porridge as a child because my family could only afford porridge. And my family could only afford porridge because I live in a class cult in which these types of people are valued very little and these types of people are valued very much and these people only get so much money and this money will only buy the dominant staple which in the terrain that I'm in is oats so I have porridge for breakfast today because of that whole list. That's all self-referential and I'll have porridge again tomorrow because I have it today and I have it today because that's the thing. So it, it all references the cult, the past. There's an endless loop. The entrance of a new energy coming in of the sphere may say there's an asymmetry here. You know, these, these gluttons up here are getting so fat and so numb due to lethargy and all that that they're not even enjoying the finest foods. These people would enjoy the finest foods but are not getting them. There, there's an imbalance. There's a dis-ease. You reference the cult, well of course that's the case because the law says that the people who own land are more valuable than people who walk through the country. You have people walking through the country and then you have people owning a piece of paper that says I own this land and if you have that bit of paper, your needs are more important than the person walking through the land. And so you can't walk here, you can't walk here, you can't walk here because these needs are more important than your needs. And so you just can't walk, you know. And, and so we, 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 of course. So that means then that the person who walks across the land has got to be, what, punished because that's what the law says. What law? The law. Whose law? We made it up. Well, that's, we all made it up and made sense to us. So. Thou, those who shall walk through the land will be put into prison. Uh, okay, so, well then, because if you're in prison, you can't earn any money. Okay, so then all you can eat is porridge. Uh, you know, the, these things seem to be linear. Well, of course, all you can eat is porridge if you can't earn any money and, you know, Grapes and cheese are expensive and croissants, uh, no, 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 no. That's for people who bought land and wouldn't let anyone on the land unless they did this and this. And so we have this, we have this dynamic. To connect with the divine, one must transcend one's ego, one's identity, one's cult. One must reference the field of symmetry. One must reference the field of the ideal, of the sphere. And in referencing the identity of the divine, one has healing, one has medicine, one has blessing, one has freedom, one has love. And 
referencing the identity of the cult. In referencing the cult, one has the yields of the cult. The cult thinks, feels, does, and bees and acts this way. And that pattern of energy yields a certain amount of sustainable well-being. The divine identity responds in a way that brings medicine, responds in a way that balances the asymmetries and the tunnel visions of a self-referential dogma, of a self-referential cult. The fear of the unknown, the reptilian brain, murders the divine impulse because it threatens the reptile with exposure to the unknown and the fears and pains they're too frightened to deal with. So we have a murder of We have a murder, a crucifixion of the divine that happens in each moment in our life where we have the divine comes here and the divine comes in. but it does not fit into the cult. It transcends the cult. That is its medicine. That's its value. And it can come in any time, particularly when we let go of rationality, when we let go of rationality, the divine can come in any time because it's simply a choice we're letting go of cause and effect. And so which do you, what, when you build your identity, what do you reference? The field? The divine energy of all that is? What do you reference? Or do you reference this is the way things were done before? This is the way this person did them and therefore this person must do them and therefore this person must do them. So we have we have the reference point. of the field and then we have the reference point of the cult and the ego built out of the cult. The field of the whole, the field of the sphere and the mishmashed identity of the individual 
framed and knocked into a hole within the cult. Now we can change our identity anytime. We can open to our identity anytime. but it involves facing the fear of the unknown. It involves believing that the universe is a friendly place, that the divine is a beneficent force, and that and that we are essentially good. <sighs> the law of intelligence blesses, rewards, and celebrates the divine identity. The law of mass crucifies the divine identity to protect the status quo. I think for the human ego to witness the murder of what is most beautiful, true, and good inside of them, to protect the mediocrity of a blind status quo, is the most unforgivable sin that every human has to witness. Because to become part of a cult is to be stripped down of the tethers to the divine. Because every cult is self-referential and built out of fear. See, even some of that, I have to let go of the tether. <sighs> to the divine, in order to see things and believe things like that. The divine is an invisible choice away. It's a step away in every cult. But the cult renders that step invisible, blind. We're lost in the delusion of the cult. <sighs> 